Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Constance Derricks. Constance is also known as the decision doctor. She is relied on by top leaders when they're faced with consequential high stakes decisions. She holds a PhD in clinical psychology, focusing on decision science and critical intervention. She has worked with leaders at organizations, including IBM, AT&T, the CDC, Lincoln Financial Group, and Cox Enterprises. She is the author of Meta Leadership, How to See What Others Don't and Make Great Decisions. And I am excited to have her on the show to talk about the idea of meta leadership. So Constance, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. I'm super excited to be here and talk about deep things. <laughs> well, this is the right the place to do it for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to start off, you know, we've had a great conversation before we pressed record, but I wanted to talk a little bit about your background because it was interesting. You you were a broker, you were with Merrill Lynch, uh, and you decided to leave that and pursue a PhD in clinical psychology and to mm -hmm. help leaders in these high stakes decisions, these high stake matters. Tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that story, because I think it's interesting. You have it on your website, so I thought I would ask you about it. Yeah, yeah. So I was a stockbroker for about five years, and um, I, uh, I should say first I was a college dropout. So, you know, it should give you pause that I had a Series 7 license, and I was advising people about their money, and I hadn't finished college yet. But um, I, I didn't like the job but I liked my clients mm. and I, I disliked the job so much that I, um, I thought I got to get out of here, but I don't know what I want to do. So I'm going to make a study. Now I wasn't a scientist at the time. So this was a very unscientific study. And I said, what do, there's got to be something I like. There's got to be something that drew me to this. And I realized I liked my clients, but I liked them. And I was also confounded by, some of my clients who were smart, successful, and experienced who made horrific decisions with their money <laughs> and wouldn't listen. And, and I, you know, I tried my best to explain to them. So one of the mistakes I was making, which I realized later, is that I was trying to influence emotional decisions with facts. And that does not work. <laughs> Yes. But I got so interested in understanding why people decide the things they do and how they decide and the influence of family and friends, even on important decisions with our money is very profound. So I quit my job and I went back to school. And first I had to finish my bachelor's degree, but luckily we had a great university in town and they let me back. <laughs> Uh, and I went from there to a graduate program in clinical psychology, always knowing that I was going to try to figure out how to use this deep knowledge. I'm going to use that word again. It's deep knowledge in human behavior uh, to help people with decisions. I didn't know how I was going to do it. And it actually took me probably seven years, the whole time I was a graduate student to figure it out. Uh, so I came out of my residency program and might finish my dissertation and uh, got hired by a consulting firm. So I never was a practicing therapist, except when I was a graduate student. And that definitely was practicing. <laughs> so this is interesting that, um, you know, I think we, we were talking about earlier about, you know, pivots that people make in their yeah. life. And I think it's really yeah. interesting that, um, you know, that you, you, you know, you mentioned you were a college dropout, you were, but you were doing something you didn't really you didn't have necessarily a passion for. And then you said, is there a pivot for me? And you, you took the pivot and end up, you know, becoming a, you know, getting your PhD, you know, yeah. get, you know, practicing uh, psychology, getting hired into a consulting firm. And yeah. it just shows you that it, it, in, and it wasn't that any stage of your life, you can make a pivot, make a change and go towards something that you're interested in. I know that's not the main subject we're talking about today, but I think it's important to, to point out that if you're feeling stuck, you can make a shift. You know, it, anyone can make a shift in their life. Anyone, any leadership team, any organization can make a make a shift and they can be pretty dramatic and i know you've worked in turnarounds in your past and that's what a turnaround is about it's about you know generating the momentum setting a direction and that's really what i did i i think i set the direction and most of my momentum at the time was to get out of the brokerage firm <laughs> that was a lot of my 
uh, of my energy was like, get me away from this. Um, and luckily I, you know, went as soon as I started back to college and I was more mature than the first time, I just thought it's the luckiest thing. It's so lucky to live in a country, to be in a place where as an adult, you can elect to pursue higher education. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I used to tell my students that when I was teaching some of my undergraduates didn't want to be there and they would ask to meet with me. And I would say, you know, if, if you, if it's not right for you now, it doesn't mean it will never be right for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I got my bachelor's degree, there was a woman uh, in my graduating class who was also a psychology major. She and her husband were in Africa with um, Albert Schweitzer. Oh, wow. She was in her 60s and she got her bachelor's degree. I mean, the whole place stood up and clapped and they should have, you know, yeah, um, yeah. it was fun having her, um, you know, so we had a woman in her 60s and we had 22 year olds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Super fun. Ah, that's so cool. I love that. And again, that that's cool? a great lesson for anyone who feels like they're stuck. You can make a shift. You can make a pivot and you, you can. can pursue something that even seems like a dream that you can do it. But for sure. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it'll be easy or yeah. straightforward. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you will, uh, you know, I was earning money. I was earning 40% of my family's income and then yeah. I went to nothing. Yeah. So that was a talk about a pivot. Yeah. 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 It's a substantial pivot <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So let's talk about your book. Uh, your, and this is kind of the reason I want to get you on, on the show. Your new book sure. is called Meta Leadership, How to See What Others Don't and Make Great Decisions. So let's just start off. What is meta leadership? Yeah. So meta leadership is actually a paradigm hmm. rather than a set of skills or competencies. It's a paradigm. And what I wanted to address with the paradigm is I wanted to give leaders a simple but powerful and valid, you know, drawing on research, valid framework that they could use to make better decisions, to see through the distortion. You know, leaders now have so much coming at them from inside their companies, from outside their companies. You know, just the context of the macro environment is so changeable. I mean, every day, I just read that uh, the big X on the Twitter bu building in uh, San Francisco is now down. You know, it was, it was the blue bird, then it was the X and now it's already down. And <laughs> not that they've changed their name, but things happen quickly and leaders, uh, I think most people in leadership positions now know that human beings experience a lot of cognitive distortions that we make mistakes. I call those invisible decision traps. But I also know that nobody can memorize and use the very long list of these cognitive traps and biases that have been beautifully described by people like Daniel Kahneman and Dan Ariely and Richard Thaler. And so I thought I've got to synthesize, I got to do something to synthesize this. And I came up with meta leadership, which is bringing together thinking and thinking about your thinking, mm. emotion, not to, I'm not encouraging leaders to be emotional and cry in meetings. What I'm encouraging them to do is recognize that emotion is an inseparable part of decisions. And we have the research to back up my claim um, from uh, decision science, but also from neuroscience and biology. Um, and then the third thing is to be aware of our default habits. So the three elements are thinking, feeling, and doing. And it's pretty simple. Um, and in the book, I explore those three dimensions by way of dichotomies. Because I wanted to do more than write a book that said, well, here's my leadership paradigm. Hope you like it. <laughs> you know, I, wanted, I wanted to put it to use in the book. And so the book is in three sections and, uh, and it's divided into dichotomies. So one chapter is about str strategy and tactics. One chapter is titled Certain and Uncertain. And I'm encouraging leaders to use thinking, emotion, and habits of behavior and awareness of all three to 
realize how often we falsely dichotomize and it undermines our decision making. So that's a long winded answer, but the book really um, evolved over a couple of years. And, you know, you're an author, so you know this. People say, how long does it take to write a book? And my <laughs> answer now is six months and 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> that's about right. It it depends, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. So each, yeah, it's it, it's done when it's done. I think that's the best answer because I think, yeah, I, I you know my second book was the one that took the longest, <laughs> but um, yeah, because it was an idea that I, that that took ten years to to get on paper. You know, Ex exactly. And over that ten years, that idea wasn't static. Right. It exactly. Was being formed and morphed and gestated and nurtured by your experiences in your work. And I think a lot of us do that. I, when I was done with my first book, I immediately wrote the second book. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that if you have an inspired idea um, and you're willing to put in the work, then you should write it. If mm. it's useful, I'm always trying to think about what would be useful uh, to my reader. And, and this one is the one I'm most proud of really. Oh, and I'll fantastic. actually hold it up for you. There viewers. it is, the red cover. Yeah. The and famous Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble ordered um, books for every one of their stores in the U.S. Oh, fantastic! I know. That's okay. great. Cool. One of my favorite uh, books, uh, Good to Great, has a red cover. So I, I'm kind yeah. of a, I like the red covers. So. Yeah. <laughs> I was biased yeah. towards yeah. it for sure. I might have been influenced by that. <laughs> it's a good. Play. It's a good person. Uh, yeah, or my beautiful. publisher. My publisher, uh, one of their designers designed the cover and I just think he's brilliant. Yeah, no, it's great cover, fantastic cover for sure. And red, you can't miss it for sure in the stores. Yeah. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about like what happens when leaders, um, when you when you go through this book and they, they understand this thinking, feeling, doing these three elements of it and they're mm -hmm. able to um, kind of capture these mega leadership skills, what happens uh, to leaders who are able to to capture these and and use them in their decision making, they um, well, first of all, they see things others don't. Mm -hmm. um, and the second is that they their decisions are more they're based on a more holistic and comprehensive understanding of the context. Context is everything. Um, you can take any group of people that you know you could characterize as a b or c but if you put them in the wrong context it's very difficult for them to thrive in fact some of the research on innovation shows that the context in which people are is every bit as important as their capacity so you want a group of people to innovate but you micromanage them good luck you know that's yeah. And I was actually asked a question earlier today about laissez-faire leadership and when is it good? And I thought, when you want people to innovate, you yeah. know, you, you put them in a bubble or literal or whatever, and you leave them alone, not forever. You say, you know, you get 90 days or six months or whatever, here's your budget, but then you don't interfere. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's about the thinking part of meta leadership is really the the scientific word is metacognition and i really thought that would be a pretty bad title for a book so <laughs> i didn't use that um but metacognition means thinking about your thinking yeah so for a leader who uses metacognition they're sort of automatically and almost like a running dialogue. It's almost like they're running Grammarly in the sidebar and need a meta leadership app. And they're asking themselves more than what am I thinking? They're asking themselves, how am I thinking? Mm. And then the emotion comes in when they say, what is, what is influencing me? Who is influencing me? What fears do I have that are influencing me? A CEO, for example, that's making a big strategic bet knows that they could be fired if it goes wrong. I, I don't know about you, but that would give me a few butterflies. Hmm. Um, and then the habits of behavior, uh, you want to watch out for how do we typically respond to this? How do we typically 
decide. And if you notice what the common assumptions are and the common habits are, that's organizational culture. Mm. And that's one way that you can notice it by what people do, not what they say. Because you, you, when you go into a company and you ask them what their culture is and they tell you, and then you measure it, it's never the same. Now, there are overlaps, but it's never exactly the same. You know, one of the things I'm curious, I'm, I'm actually studying right now the data, data analytics and how that yeah. should be more uh, involved in leaders' decisions, especially in a fast-moving world. We should be using Correct. more data. And one of the things I've been reading about their various studies is that many older, older managers uh, struggle with making the shift because they have a lifetime of using intuition and experience to make their decisions. And so now mm -hmm. there's young people coming up to them and saying, here's the data. This is what yeah. we should be doing. And they say, no, no, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for 20 years. Is it, is there an age uh, part of this discussion? Is there, uh, is, is, is it a problem for older managers to worry that they might get stuck in, this is what's always worked for me for the, the past 20 years. So I'm, and, and they're, they're harder, are harder to change into start thinking about thinking and, and, and applying these skills or is it, um, or is not not a case? Because I I certainly have seen it in the studies when it relates to data analytics uh, decision making. Mm -hmm. I think anytime there's a shift in how we work, that people who have a long history of working in a different way have a, I'd say a greater challenge mm. in making the adaptation. But you know, you said a minute ago about uh, people. Um, something well actually what what was going through my head was the movie moneyball yeah yeah <laughs> you know, right where you've got the manager of the baseball team and he's like well, you know he's got a lot of bluster and um it, it, if you have a group of people in your organization that are used to making decisions based on their unique experience the worst combination is when a they don't have recorded in their brain any history of their mistakes That's they're it. only remembering their success yeah. and the longer that list of successes the more entrenched and rightly so let's let's back up a minute and say we're talking about human beings mm. i've done it this way i've been successful my company's done well now you're coming and show, showing me a new way part of the problem part of the resistance comes in when people are shown something new in a way that feels like an assault. Mm. It feels like you're saying to them, well, thank goodness I'm here because you've been really doing this all wrong up till now. And I'm here and here's my spreadsheets and here's my, but what we're, and this is where leadership is needed. Mm. If the leader allows the young bucks or the young Turks to go to the old people that are, you know, stuck in their ways, the boomers, um, and have that conversation unfacilitated, then you're probably going to have more problems than if you gather people together and you have them look at a situation in multiple ways and say, well, here's one way we look at it. And here's one way we look at it. And here's another way we could look at it. And you make it a rule in the meeting or you make it a rule in one-on-one -on -one conversations that you're going to suspend judgment, that your criteria for deciding methodology is going to be what's your objective and what do we know is valid? That's it. If you, Because what I see is people arguing over methodology sometimes when they don't know where the hell they're going. It's like they don't know what what the objective is, but they're arguing about whether or not they're going to use a pen or a pencil or a computer. And it's like, wait a minute, what are you trying to achieve here? And the leaders have to always remember what they're trying to achieve is they want to build an environment where the smart, experienced people and the knowledgeable people can thrive. And that as many of those people from all sorts of different backgrounds and ages and education can come together to achieve a common purpose. And so I think sometimes it gets set up as a clash between um, 
you know, ages. Somebody asked me once at the end of a speech about millennials and, you know, why millennials were like this and, you know, why people my age didn't understand millennials. And I just looked at him. I said, it's a bunch of crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she went, what? And I said, every generation, every tranche, every wave of people who are maturing, who are coming out of college or coming out of high school, have developmentally share some things in common. And those are very similar to what people my age or people older than me, people younger than me experienced. You tend to be idealistic. You tend to minimize the barriers in front of you. If you've had an advantaged background, let me let me stipulate that. And uh, and I said, you know, when I was that age, um, you know, my parents were sure we were going to ruin the world. They were positive. Um, but there's a developmental stage there where a lot of these behaviors are very normative. Yeah. And we don't need to have consultants help us with that. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, I, I just, I gave a speech this morning and I was talking about that I very much. I said to, that one oh, of the really? things, one of the, well, just to talk about the idea that, that people are messy, right? And I think great people leaders recognize that. And they also recognize that people are amazing. And so, you know, it's those two elements of human nature, you know, and if you can sort of accept that people are messy, but also realize that they have this great potential, uh, then you, you don't get hung up on it. You know, you're like, yeah. okay, well, this this person has this strange habit of whatever, you know, you know, always being grumpy until 10 a.m. That's just that person's unique characteristics. And but they're they're a phenomenal programmer. Right. So how can I use this person with these quirks to get the best out of my organization? I think that's the that's where, where leaders come in to say to, to yeah. be able to find the, the special the uniqueness of each individual and put them in the right place in their organization. I think that it's a very special and beautiful talent when people are good at putting people in the right spot. Actually, I'm on the board of trustees of Mary Baldwin University, which is in Virginia. And our board chair, Gabby McCree, she might cringe when she knows I've said this on a podcast. She's very, very good at looking across the board and saying, you know, I'm going to ask, and she'll call me and say, I'm going to ask this person to do this. What do you think? And I'm, I don't know that I've ever said, I think that's a terrible idea. She's really good at the matching. Um, I met her and joined the board and within a matter of months, I was the governance chair. Now she knew I was a governance expert, but she had, she didn't know me. Mm. Once she had that, then she said, will you do this? And we got the governance committee fired up again. And we got, we did a bunch of work in six months. Um, and I was happy that she asked me to do it because I like that stuff. Yeah. That's great. I love that. So kind of going back to the decision-making side, what are some common leadership uh, decision-making traps that they can fall into, that we can fall into? I'm a, I'm a leader. I fall into it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the, the big one, the one that I wrote about in my book is dichotomous thinking, is mm -hmm. which constricts your options, right? You think, well, we either need to do this or we need to do that. Rarely are there just two things. And if you think about great leaders and people that accomplish great things, I'll, um, let's, let's talk about Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer, who had this group of uh, physicists and engineers and technicians and smart people. I mean, a lot of people that worked on the Manhattan Project later were awarded Nobel Prizes. Richard Feynman included, who was never even mentioned in the movie, by the way, which kind of irritated me. But um, he, Oppenheimer is credited as being a master synthesizer. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorite words. So if you think you're in this, this or that, ask yourself, is there a synthesis possible? Do we need a catalyst to do the synthesis? Another leadership trap is, um, and this is very common, I bet you've got like a suitcase full of examples for what I'm about <laughs> to tell you, is that when things go wrong or they look like they're going wrong, what we want to do is we want to quickly organize our facts, which of course are, we usually have a faulty collection of facts, 
because they come through our screens. And we want our facts to um, support what we believed 10 minutes ago. Like we already know the answer. And so we're just gonna do a little fact finding, but it's kind of flawed. And then we're gonna look at, um, uh, we look for who's to blame. And so instead of looking first at what are we trying to do here? Who's in what role? What's the process? Is it common? Is it understood? Is it shared? Instead of stepping through those things, we leap to the interpersonal mm. and the intrapsychic. And I sometimes when I'm talking to a leadership team and I show them it's a triangle that's got those four things on it. And at the very top and the smallest part is, you know, it, it is the person, is the individual personality or whatever. Um, and I said, you know, a lot, most of the time, if you solve for the other things, most of the, what looks like a personal issue will evaporate. Mm -hmm. But in the rare case that it doesn't, now, you know, for sure you have a real problem and that's the person, mm -hmm. but when you leap to blame before you look for cause. And before you look for cause holistically, you get so stuck and a lot of conflict in organizations happens because of this. And I can't tell you how many times I've unsnarled um, teams that were locked in conflict just by simply walking them through that process. And now if the person that you're blaming is really problematic for some reason, then you should remove them. Hmm. Uh, but I think we overdiagnose and people say to me a lot too, they may say it to you too, but I think they say it to me because I'm a psychologist, but I could be wrong about that. They'll come to me and they'll go, I think he has a drug problem. <laughs> you or she's bipolar. I was like, and I'm like, eh, 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 eh. no, we are not diagnosing here. Yeah. That's not what we're doing. We're looking for the cause of problems. And if this person is a problem, we'll address the behavior, but we're not going to do psychoanalysis at work. Okay. And I'm thinking in my head, you know, I actually know how, but that's not why I'm there. Yeah. 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 I think you, I think you, you're right. I mean, I think organizations, people are quick to try to find a solution as to why a person isn't yeah. sort of, you know, I, you know, over the years, I've had employees that were, I don't know how to, to, to say, but they're just sort of want, they're on the corner of the reservation. They're they're just different than everybody else. And and I think that we, those outliers have always been like, I can see organizations and people talking about why that person is the way they are and and uh, and trying, like you said, to, to diagnose what the problem is. Right. Uh, but a lot of times it's just their unique personalities. And, and, and that's where I was kind of going back to what I was saying is that I found that you know, sometimes we're not all alike. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, right. every person, the people are so amazing because they're so unique and so different. And, uh, and I think sometimes as leaders, we recognize that that's just a, that's just, that's the way that person is. And instead of trying to change them, it's more trying to get the best out of them or put them in the right place, place in the organization where they can make yeah. the most good, you know? Yeah. Create the right context for them to perform. You know, not everybody is highly social. Right, um, exactly. That, exactly. That the person who has a very, very low need for social connection is often um, considered very weird in organizations. Right. That's exactly uh, what I'm thinking. Us uncomfortable and we want to fix them. So we want to diagnose. And now it's really super normal for people to want to understand their surroundings and other people and organize what they see and make conclusions. That's really normal. And it, it that's not necessarily harmful, but what's harmful is when you give somebody um, a label that is, um, yeah. you know, a dis that's really a diagnosis. And um, that's just, that's just not appropriate. <laughs> um, if, if you think somebody has a, say for example, a problem drinking. Yeah then rather than talk to them about their drinking problem, because you might be wrong, um, talk to them about their behavior. You know, yeah. they're absent a lot, they're late a lot. It, talk to them about the behavior. And that, if they want to disclose that they're struggling with 
with a problem, then maybe you can point them to help, but you don't need to be the one deciding what's wrong. No, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for sure. Yeah, we, as we go through, you know, as we're going through the book and we're learning about, you know, decision making and the best ways to make decisions um, and sort of the thinking behind the, the thinking of decision. Yeah. That's um, a big one. Yeah. <laughs> what are some questions we should ask ourselves uh, to understand maybe what's driving our decisions, whether it's emotions, whether it's uh, like fear? You mentioned a CEO is making a decision because they're afraid they're going to get fired. So fear based decisions or emotional based. So what are some questions we should be asking ourselves as we go through those decision making processes? Well, I think let's take it by category um, in metacognition to uh, not be satisfied with what am I thinking, but to ask yourself, how am I thinking about this? Mm -hmm. When have I had a similar situation? And what was I thinking about then? And then to challenge yourself to say, when have I made a really bad decision when I thought I was very clear headed? Um, anybody who's been divorced can probably do some reflecting on that one. Um, you know, it could be personal examples uh, because we tend to want to um, sort of revel in our successes and, you know, think about those. Um, what is Warren Buffett's, uh, Charlie Munger, um, Warren Buffett's partner, um, has a habit of studying failure, not only his own, but he studies failure in business. And he keeps records of this as far as I've been able to tell from what I've read, um, because he doesn't ever want to feel immune mm. to mistakes. And I think when we just get, we get a little smug sometimes, we all do. Um, and then with emotion, you know, you said, how do we know or something about are we making an emotional decision? We are always making an emotional decision. We got the science. <laughs> the mm -hmm. sci it's, it's like your brain, you know, people who don't know any better talk about right brain, left brain. Um, and, you know, I'm a this and I'm a that. That's actually not true. The brain is a network. It's a whole thing. And our experience as human beings is cognitive and emotional. It's electrical, it's biochemical. And the only time one of those things stops is when we die. Mm. There's, no, there's no point in our lives when some system shuts down in favor of another. Now, sometimes things tend to dominate. If you're upset and you have a lot of corticosteroids in your bloodstream, then your thinking is different than it was before that happened. So emotions, I think, can best be uncovered by asking um, yourself, how am I feeling? I don't mean emotionally, I mean physically, physiologically, because we call it feelings because it starts with psychomotor and you know, physical symptoms my stomach's upset. I have a headache. The back of my neck is tense. My fist is clenched because I'm so mad at that person, you know, whatever it, whatever it happens to be. And then once you have that clue, the physiological clue, then you can ask yourself what you think is prompting that. And then the third one is, you know, to ask yourself about your habits of behavior. You know, what do I normally do in this situation? How's that working for me? You know, you can be a little sarcastic with yourself. Say, how's that working out? Um, and to look around and, and realize the habits that the people around you share with you and understand the power of that. You know, when you hire a new employee and they come in and they violate some unspoken, unwritten rule and everybody goes, Ugh. no. Now, you know, you have a habit like the boss always sits in that chair, for example, mm, yeah. that's a habit of behavior. That's not a super important habit of behavior, but a super important one is we don't ever, uh, we don't ever talk about the fact that we're um, kind of hiding some of the data from our boss. We mm. don't talk about the fact that we sort of jiggered those test results on the emissions you know, we don't talk about the ignition switch problems at GM because it violates 
our code with one another. Um, and then, of course, GM got in a lot of trouble for that. But Mary Barra, when she was a brand new CEO at GM, what did she do? Did she go in with her gun drawn looking for who to blame? No. She said, what was happening that allowed this to happen? Yeah. She asked a meta question. Yeah. And she's in the book. God, I love it. That's so good. So those are, those are, it's, it's really, uh, one person said to me, it's really a reflective process. I said, it, it is a reflective process. And when you're learning to use it, it starts out feeling like it's slowing you down, but soon it will become more second nature to you. Hmm. That makes sense. So what, uh, what final message would you like to leave with our listeners as we kind of roll, wrap up this, uh, this great discussion about meta leadership? I believe that leadership has a lot to do with learning mm -hmm. and from both sides that one of the attitudes that meta leaders have that keeps them out of trouble more often than others and helps them see what others don't is that they are curious. Uh, they are willing to let go of something they thought was true last week and now they have new information. So they're mm -hmm. willing to let go. And the other thing they do that I just love, and I have multiple examples in my head right now of people I've worked with, is they learn in public. Mm -hmm. And what they do, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my clients was uh, visiting a location away from headquarters, and uh, they were loading trucks. It was a distribution center, and they were loading trucks. And he just asked questions. He said, what, why are they loaded like that? Tell me, explain. And how do you figure out what the optimal way to load the truck is so you, you know, get the most stuff in every truck? Um, and this person explained it to him. And then another person chimed in. And it ended up in a conversation. And it ended up changing how they load the trucks. Mm. But this this person who's a CEO allowed somebody many layers below him to be his teacher with an audience. And I just wanted to give him a standing ovation when he told me this story, because I said, do you know what you just did? He goes, yeah, I learned. I go, yeah, but you just modeled for everyone that was there. The learning is important. Uh, that's really powerful. I, I, the other side of it too that I that I took away, and I, I've seen this in my career too, is is that questions. A, a leader just being curious and asking questions can sometimes spark new and innovative ways of doing things. And even yes. that the leader doesn't know the answer, but just oh, says, "Is there <laughs> is there a way to do this better?" And just that's the question, and just allow the the team to 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 go through those ideas. And I've seen that time and time again where. Just yeah. and and I say that uh, I say this a lot is when I first became a plant manager uh, at 32 years old, I thought I had to have all the right answers. And oh, then yeah. what I learned in three years of running that first business was, I just had to have really good questions and then yeah. be be smart enough to be quiet and listen to the discussions and then yeah. sort of make decisions. But I I really found that questions were more important than answers as a leader. And I think that the questions that are asked with a tone of curiosity that are, they're not gotchas, they're not yeah, ambush. That's it. That where there's a lot of sincerity, I often say to my clients, you need to be an explorer in your own territory. Ah, and that like means that. asking questions, but it also means walking around. One of my clients, mm -hmm. when he gets responsibility for a new location, one of the things he does is he goes to goes into work every day through a different door. Like he doesn't mm. have a routine. And on his way to his office, he stops and talks to two or three people. I don't mean, how are you? What's your name? Are those your kids in the picture? But he has a real conversation. It might go on for 10 minutes. Mm. Pays off hugely in him. He's a very admired leader. People want to work for him. And he's turned around more than one or two. <laughs> I love hearing that because that's just, you know, the, 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 it's basic and, but, but so many people don't do it, but the power of your presence as a leader is, 
is really important. It's something, yeah. especially when you're dealing with a, a lot of employees, you've got to be out there. You got to be, you know, spending time getting to know people. And um, yeah, I think it's a really good, it's, it's a great example of somebody who wants to influence. Uh, you have to get to know your people before you can influence and they have to know, get to know you. So it's about and being present. Is. Yeah. yeah. And, and he does it so well that when he needs to issue an edict, which he rarely does, but when he does, people are like, okay. Yeah. They trust him. They trust him because they know him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. powerful. So this book is called Meta Leadership, How to See What Others Don't and Make Great Decisions. Highly encourage uh, listeners that, that you look for this book uh, because this is something that we make decisions all day long. And I think uh, in the world is getting more complicated and we've got to be thinking more about how we make decisions and what we're going through when we make those decisions. So a very important book. How can our listeners find out more about uh, you, your services, and this new book? Well, my website is my name, which will be in the show notes. It will be in the show notes, yes. <laughs> there no is no hope <laughs> of spelling my name without without having seen it first. The good news is if you Google my name, you will get me. Uh, it's so unique. So my website um, has some free resources. I have some articles. I have a blog. And I also have a meta leadership self-assessment that is free. So if your listeners want to go to my website, there will be a pop-up box you know, one of those obnoxious pop-ups on a website. And uh, if they'll just type in their email address, then the assessment will be sent to their email box. And I will not be pursuing them <laughs> because they gave me uh, their email. Uh, they might get my newsletter, but um, but but that's it. Well, fantastic. We're going to go ahead and put uh, links in the show notes for uh, the website, the self-assessment, and the book. Um, and this has been a fantastic discussion. Constance, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing this, uh, some things to think about when it comes to decision, decision, decision making and what we go through in that decision making. So I think you brought a lot of things to the forefront, things that we need to be thinking about more as leaders. Really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing all of this. Well, thank you for having me, John. I mean, it was we, we, I had a great time. I hope you did. And we had a wonderful conversation before you hit the record button. So <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, feel like I've met somebody that I want to stay in touch with. And I feel the same way. Absolutely. This has been great. And, and I, we probably should have pressed record in the first part of the conversation. We would have two, <laughs> two great conversations. <laughs> so no, it's fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot and I really appreciate your Thank work you on, on yeah. this subject. Thank you. Great. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.